Well, it was an exciting week for our church. I know confirmation is, um, I don't know, it's a really exciting thing. I think a lot of families just kind of do it to check it off the box, but uh, man, you're really missing out if you don't continue to come because it's, it's, uh, it's such a wonderful chance for the church to continue to invest in the child and for the child to really step up. Because, um, you know, children and youth, they really are the church. They're not the future. They're already doing so many incredible things. And so um, thankful for, uh, for Paul and everyone in the youth department that has done such a great job of pouring into them and for Stephanie who has done so much uh, with the youth department as well for six years. So I'm Reagan Gilliland, pastor of adult discipleship here at Christ United, and I have to say I'm a little uh, nervous to be in here. So when I first got here last July, uh, I preached four or five weeks in a row in here, uh, but it was just to a camera. (laughs) So I've actually never been with people in the room. So I've been a little nervous, I have to admit, but um, I'm really excited to be here as we kick off Faith Matters, as Stephanie uh, talked about. So I wanted to begin this morning with asking a question. Um, How do we define good? We probably have um, different rankings, different qualifiers. Uh, I'm sure if I were to ask this entire room who or what is good, we'd probably have a lot of different answers. Because, you know, we've all had different life experiences. We've all have different backgrounds. We've been raised differently. We vote differently. So many things influence how we come to decide what is good and what is not. And so really, at the end of the day, we're just different, right? There's no way around it. We're, we're simply different. And because of that, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, people have decided that some people are more right than others, or maybe they're better than others. Maybe some are just more good than others. And like Peter, who we are going to read about today, we have forgotten at the very core that all of us carry the image of God. There is something about that truth that makes it clear that we all share in something together, that perhaps there is good in each and every one of us, and that maybe we're more alike than originally thought. So today's scripture comes from the book uh, of Acts, which we're going to be in in the next several weeks. And so we are going to be in chapter 10, verses uh, starting in verse 34 through 48. Hear these words. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to, all, to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testified about him, and everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Even on the Gentiles. Can you believe it? (laughs) For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone... Withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So in this Faith Matters, Ron, I'm Ron Burgundy, question mark. I don't know if you all get that. Um, We're going to be looking at some different theologians. And uh, Chris and Stephanie did a great job of picking a few, so we're going to have kind of a diverse, um, diverse uh, 
choice of voices over the next few weeks. I'm really excited. And so today's theologian is a guy named Irenaeus, which we all know, right? You all have his books on your nightstand, I'm sure. I'm sure you read him every night. But in case you, it's been a while since you've read him, uh, he was born in 130 AD and is considered really one of the first theologians. His writings actually predate when the New Testament was fully uh, finalized on, when it was canonized. And what I really love about him, um, other than he's very easy to read, unlike a lot of the theologians we read in seminary, um, is that he really comes across more as a pastor than anything else. He was really passionate about leading people to know that this God that we follow is a great God of love and is creator overall. And so I really appreciate all of his writings and his whole philosophy, especially when he honed in on that we carry the image of God, every single one of us, and that we are wonderful creations, and that we are good. And so we have this incredible worth and dignity because we were created with, with purpose, with love, that, with intention. So he, at the time when he was writing, he was writing against uh, people called the Gnostics, who they believed we were created by accident, maybe actually kind of a mistake, maybe by lesser deities, not by this great God who is creator of everything. So this idea of having this mark, this image of God, that we had this kind of this divine spark was like ludicrous to Gnostics. So Irenaeus was writing against that. Irenaeus had such a high view of creation that humankind was the pinnacle of God's creation. And we can, we can see that when we go back and read in Genesis, you know, everything that God created was good. And then God gets to us and says, this is very good. And so being reminded that all that God creates is good and that we all share in this is not something we need to dismiss so quickly. All of us in this room are pretty incredible. Now, I don't want us to get too high on ourselves, but I think if we can think about that collectively, that we all share in something, that it's, we all have something in common, this article that I read uh, by a Rome, American Roman um, Catholic priest who teaches at Oxford, so pretty smart guy. His name is Thomas G. I'm going to say Winandy. He wrote about how the wonder and amazement that we are created in the image and likeness of God is something that we really should, we should kind of sit in for a while. He goes on to say this. I have a quote. For Irenaeus to be simply human clothes us with a dignity that is inconceivable, a dignity that pertains not to some spiritual aspect of our being, but to our very created humanness. It is the very humanness of human beings that for Irenaeus reflects who and what God is. For in making us human, he made us in his own likeness. Now you may be wondering what in the world this has to do with the passage today. But like most passages you read in the Bible, it's important to know what comes before. So many of you might have said, okay, who is Peter even talking to? So when we go back to the beginning of chapter 10, we're, inter we're introduced to a guy named Cornelius. He's this Roman centurion who is this Roman officer, uh, kind of high ranking with some power. So he's described as uh, this Roman, Cornelius, as a God-fearing man, that he prays constantly. And we find that at three o'clock in the afternoon, he has this vision from God. And God tells him, okay, I want you to send some people to go find this man named Simon, who's called Peter. And so where Peter is, he, uh, he's staying with a, a tanner, I believe. And as he's waiting for his food, <laughs> uh, Peter is praying on a rooftop and he goes into a trance and there's this like really weird creature <laughs> that comes forth. And uh, God says, you know, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. And the voice said to him, again, what God has made clean, you must not call, call profane. And then he wakes up and Cornelius's men are there. And then Peter goes to meet Cornelius. And Peter meets Cornelius, again, this Roman high-ranking officer. Peter's not really anyone, and Cornelius like falls at his feet and kind of begins to worship him. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. But he's having this moment with Cornelius kind of. So I want you 
to imagine that you are Peter in this moment. And I love Peter. He is so entirely flawed. He's such a knucklehead, but you cheer him on all the time. You're always like, come on, Peter, you can do it. You can get it. You can get it this time. And he's kind of this underdog that we're always cheering for. But I want you to imagine Peter in this moment meeting Cornelius. Peter is a very good Jew, entirely committed and faithful um, to his beliefs. He loves the law. He lives by the law. You've also grown up under Roman rule. You've been oppressed by it. And then you've also literally walked with Christ, the awaited Messiah. You've been in that inner circle. You had a front row seat. You were chosen. And then being a Jew, you knew that you were God's chosen people. You had grown up thinking you were the ones. You were special. You weren't a Gentile. You weren't a Samaritan. You were a Jew. And then the Romans had been part of crucifying your Lord and Savior. And so Peter had a hard time with Cornelius because Cornelius represented so much of who Peter was not to associate with. He was an enemy. And to be in the mix uh, with a company of a Gentile was a no-no. That's why Peter in that vision set, you know, talks about clean and profane things because if you eat with a Gentile, you're going to have unkosher food, be unclean, all of that. But maybe what was most on Peter's mind was, you know, Cornelius, were you part of ordering certain soldiers to crucify my Lord? I don't don't know. So Peter was uncomfortable because he had been taught a different way. Maybe not necessarily from Jesus himself. We'll talk about that. But he had been conditioned his whole life to think very differently about a Roman especially a Roman soldier, a centurion, one with quite a bit of power. They were scary, and they were mean, and they were a threat. Now, you would think that Peter would have gotten it sooner. He would have been happy to go visit Cornelius. Like, he would have been jumping at joy to share the gospel with someone new, someone outside. I mean, he had traveled and listened to to Christ. He had been with with Jesus when Jesus took time to talk with those who were sinners, when when Jesus had literally touched people that were unclean, the lepers and, and all that, he had eaten in homes of sinners. He had given forgiveness to the worst of the worst. He made time for those who Jews had often um, been afraid of or said, oh, oh, we need to forget about them. He spoke of parables, highlighting sons that ran away that were foolish, rich men that didn't get, couldn't give up things, about a Samaritan who took care of someone and that we needed to model our lives after Samaritan. And yet Peter still struggle talking with Cornelius. I think Peter had forgotten for a moment who Christ came for. It wasn't just one person. It was for all. It was for all humankind, for all of history, for who we think are good and for those who we think are bad. Jesus did not come for one person, not for one people group, and not for one nation. When we go back in the very beginning of Acts, in, in 1 8, it says this. I'm going to read off the screen because pages stick together. Um, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is Jesus' kind of final instructions to disciples when they're huddling up and Jesus is putting his hands and he's like, okay, break. This is what the game plan is. And so Jesus had to say, look, you cannot. You cannot hold this message just for us, for your little neighborhood, for your little group. It's not for one group anymore. It's not for one type of person. It's not for one nation. Everyone must know. Everyone must hear it. You must travel to places of people you do not like. You must talk to people that you think are your enemies. You must eat things that are unclean. Every wall that you want to build up, you have to tear it down. Where there's a border, I want you to cross it. And when there is fear or worry, I need you to let it go. Cornelius is Peter's realization that Cornelius is part of that Judea, Samaria, into the earth. Those that are outside our view, outside our circle, is exactly who we need to be reaching. And we need to stop being afraid of them. Poor Peter had to un learn a lot. 
And this was a struggle for the early church to realize that all were welcome, that all had a place at the table, that all people shared in something together, shared in common of being created by God, and that all of them, all of them had an image within them, even the Gentiles, even the Samaritans, everyone, even a Roman soldier. They all had sacred worth. They all had dignity. And for us, I believe there's a reckoning in all of us realizing that this gospel message really is for all. And we've got to stop reaching the same kind of people and only wanting to create programs that reach the same kind of people that perhaps we need to branch out in what we teach, what we talk about, and who we bring in. Chris shares today in his sermon in the sanctuary about the newest Gallup poll that for the first time, less than 50% of the people in America claim being part of a church, a mosque, or synagogue. In the last 21 years, there's been a steep decline of people wanting to be part of a faith community. And I know we probably feel it at times. Sometimes we look around and think, why are there not more people here? Why are not more people joining? And I think we've been like Peter thinking maybe we were the only right ones, that we were the favorites, that we had it figured out. And so now we are arriving at our Cornelius moment. Those that we think may practice different or have different views or vote differently, they are the ones that belong here too. For far too long we've tried to make this an exclusive club when it was never meant to be one. See, our incarnation represents that Christ became like all of us, all of us in the world, not one type of person, but all of us. And so all of us can be seen in Christ and God's image in all of us. And so therefore, this movement, this following of Christ is not for one type of person. In fact, there are other ways to worship God and the practices that people do can be faithful. Like we need to stop getting caught up with like, well, I read that scripture different, so you must not be faithful. Or you don't raise your hands high enough when you praise. You're not doing it right. I mean, we get really nitpicky about things. And so I think we need to focus more on the common humanity that we all share, that we're all created by God, carry the image, and that we are good. Arenas wrote this, in his immeasurable love, he became what we are to make us what he is. And that was for all. He became like all of us. There's a fairly well-known passage or verse in Galatians that says this, there's no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male and female. For all of you, all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So when I think about Peter, when I think about Cornelius, when I think about Irenaeus, and when I think about us, I know that we need to share in our common humanity, that we need to share in the fact that we are much more alike than maybe different, and that we have goodness. And that whenever, whenever we withhold hospitality or care, or we don't move toward equality and equity and justice for those who are oppressed, then we contribute to the narrative that says that some are better than others, some are more superior. And whenever we withhold the gospel message from the other, we miss the whole point that Jesus really is Lord of all. There's a lot packed in this chapter of Acts. I'd really encourage you to go home and read it today. I had a lot of thoughts. I had a lot of feelings. But here are my few takeaways when I was reading this. One, who do we need to stop seeing as an enemy Who do we need to stop seeing as scary or as a threat? Two, who do I need to see that as faithful even if they believe slightly different than I do? And three, who do I need to seek out and make room for here? Friends, why faith matters, why faith matters, this this topic especially, is because so many of our neighbors have been told they don't matter they don't belong, that they're less than, and they need to change something about themselves. 
those with disabilities, immigrants, refugees, our LGBTQ brothers and sisters, and our people of color. And this passage reminds me (laughs) that they all belong, every single one, because they all, every single one of them carries God's image. And Jesus is Lord of all. Let's pray. God, this message is one that is convicting and challenging. We're so sorry for the ways that we have forgotten that you created us all, that you can be found in all of us. So continue to soften our hearts, open our eyes to who we need to see, who we need to embrace, and who we need to love. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.